I mentioned last week, and it was my full intention to wrap up today on our sermon series on Church on the Move. Um, but as I was preparing for that, God steered me in a completely different direction. Um, and yeah, it just sometimes things don't always go as we plan as followers of Jesus Christ. When we're following Jesus, he takes us in directions that we don't always expect and, and plan. And I'm thankful for that, really thankful for that. Um, it, it actually gives me confidence that God is doing the leading and it's not just simply going off of my own planning or, or what we put out in, in, in front of us. Um, but I believe God has put this message on my heart uh, for two reasons. It's, it's, it's for me. But I believe there also are many of us that really need to hear this word today. And, and like I said, I really need to hear this word today. Um, I may be preaching it, but I do believe God is going to be the one speaking to both my heart and to yours. The title of our message today is Enduring with Joy. If you don't mind, please allow me to start this morning with some questions for us, um, just to answer in your heart, and if you want to nod to them, um, just to kind of keep us united, please, please do so. How many of you, um, would you say, are going through some kind of trial right now? If you identify with this, maybe again, you could just nod with me. If It, it can be anything from something that's small, or something that's big. It can be something that's happening externally, outside of you, or it could be a trial and a, and a challenge that's happening inside of you, like a turmoil or a conflict inside. It can be something that's been going on for quite some time, for a long time, or something that's just happening more recently, and so it's a shorter time. It can be a physical trial, it can be a spiritual trial, it could be a, an emotional one, or a professional one, or a relational kind of challenge. It's really anything. If you identify the, with this, here's another follow-up question for you. As you're going through this challenge, this difficulty, this, this hardship, are you also experience, experiencing God's joy through it? Is the joy of the Lord a real experience for you as you are enduring and, and going through whatever it is that you're going through? Or does this joy feel actually a little bit more distant and far away or perhaps even non-existent for you? I don't know, perhaps you, some of you have already experienced a type of burnout or going through um, something like that to where you feel like you've reached the very end of your ability to keep going on and forward. If this is something you can relate to, here's my last question. Despite all of it, do you desire, do you, do you want to experience God's joy right now in the situation that you're in? If that's a yes, then I encourage you to Listen closely to the Spirit's ministry into your heart because I believe this message is for you or for you to share with somebody you know because in God's Word, we will see and you see throughout Scripture that joy, that joy is not a product of our gritting our teeth and enduring and going through the hardships that we're going through. No. Joy is meant to be the very fuel that enables us to endure all through our life here on earth, through all of the hardships and trials and tribulations that we experience as followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, we will see in just a minute here that it is this joy that leads to producing endurance. So God's joy is not something that results because we endure 
hardships and trials. It's just the opposite. God's joy is what we desperately need in order to endure through our child trials and challenges. And it's God's joy that produces endurance through us. Let's look at today's Bible quote. It comes from James chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. And it reads this, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Consider it a great joy. And some other translation says, consider it pure joy or all joy. Whenever we as Christians experience any kind of trials, trials of various kinds, what this means and what we're going to be able to start to see is that joy is a provision that's already made and, and there for us as Christians. That in Christ, God has made joy, His joy available for us to operate out of whether we actually feel it in our emotions or we don't feel it in our emotions. Um, because yes, we can feel joy in our emotions. That, that's part of the gift of our emotions. It, it is to feel the, the wonderful gifts and the wonderful blessings of the Lord as well as the heartaches and the pains and the anguishes here in this world. But joy is not in the source of our emotions. Emotions are simply... Uh, a response to a source. We, we, all our emotions have a source. And they are simply responding to that source. Our real source of joy, the, the source of, our real, of real joy, is in God and Him alone. Psalm 16, 11 says, You will make known to me the way of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. It's in God's presence, presence where there is the fullness of joy. That's the source. That's the object. That's where our joy comes from. And our emotions can respond to that and express that. But joy is in God. First Chronicles 16.27 says, Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His dwelling place. Romans 15.13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the one who fills us with His joy because joy is, comes from Him. And this joy, my brothers and sisters, is a provision that's already been given, it's already been made for us and available for us in Christ Jesus. But what Scripture also makes clear is that it is through faith and obedience to God's Word this is the way we actually appropriate this provision of His joy into our life and into our situation. It's through faith and through faith in action, right? Obedience that we then operate out of this joy, that we experience this joy, and that this joy becomes the very fuel for what we are enduring in whatever situation that we're going through. So James says that whenever we experience trials of various kinds, we are to consider it a great joy. This word consider in the Greek means to carefully 
calculate. It's where we get the English word for log logarithm. It's to carefully calculate, carefully assess, carefully count, right? Um, similar to maybe how we do a cost-benefit analysis. You know, pros list and cons list, and we carefully calculate that. And it's through this careful analysis and calculation that it becomes crystal clear and very obvious that the reward far outweighs the costs. Similar to how most of us, if not all of us, know that the temporary pains of regular exercise is incomparable to the lasting rewards to our overall health. See, I told you I'm preaching to myself here. So are these temporary trials that we also go through in life, whether they are emotional, they are physical, they are mental, they, 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 are, they can be draining and they can be painful, no? But when we choose to appraise these trials spiritually through the reality of God's word, this careful calculation shows us clearly that what comes out on the other side of the equation is of incomparable value. So James tells us to consider these temporary trials a great joy because here's the equation. These trials test our faith. And that's a good thing, okay? That's not a bad, that's a good thing. It's actually a very important thing because this testing process, it is through this testing process, the testing of our faith, where endurance is birthed. And it's produced in us. This is the endurance that we need, we really need, so we don't give up. This is the endurance that enables us to finish what God has called us to do, what He's given us to do. This is the endurance that enables us to see His promises finally fulfilled in us, to see Isaac born, to, to see the promised land, to see Jericho fall, to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt, to see the Messiah birthed into the hearts of the people that we love and that we've been praying for. And this is the kind of endurance that is produced through our joy, through us considering the things that we're going through as great joy because they test our faith and they produce in us an endurance of incomparable value. One that we greatly need to run this race of, of life in faith. So how do we then endure with joy? Well, let's answer that more concrete, concretely as we then flip our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, then flip over there. We'll have the verses in slide form as well. We're going to look at just the th first three verses of chapter 12. And I believe it's going to provide some life-giving clarity and answers for us. There are four imperatives that the author of Hebrews lays out in this passage. And I believe if we choose, and here's the key word, to choose, to put them into action, to apply them into our life, we will begin to operate out of God's joy through the trials and tribulations that we are going through. And they will produce and fuel our endurance as followers of Jesus Christ. Let's get into our first point in our sermon notes today. How do we endure with joy? Firstly, we must lay aside every hindrance and Sin. This is what Hebrews chapter 12 and the first part of verse 1 reads. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. The one theme that constantly runs through 
chapter 12 of Hebrews is endurance. And, and, and just as a quick context, um, the Jewish believers who are receiving this letter are actually experiencing spiritual weariness. They're getting weary in their faith and they're feeling tempted to give up. So the writer of Hebrews is encouraging them. He's imparting God's courage and strength into them to keep moving forward. And the chapter before, in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer um, lists out all these people of faith. I've heard this chapter coined or referred to as the Hall of Faith because it's listed with all these men and women of faith in the Old Testament who lived by faith in God and who demonstrated their faith in God with visible action. And, but they no longer dwell on earth, but they now surround us like a great cloud of witnesses. And this Word witness does not mean uh, like an audience or a spectator sitting in the stands watching passively or even worse, waiting to be entertained. That's not the picture here. The word witness that we use in the English actually derives directly from the Greek word that is used for martyr. Uh, I believe Pastor Tim Dilmuth uh, Voice of the Martyrs Korea um, shared this one time in in our mess in his message when he was here um, either last year or the year before uh, if I remember correctly and so what this means for God's people as as being witnesses it simply means that we testify of who God is that we bear witness to what He has done that's what it means to be a witness. Yeah, and so these cloud of great cloud of witnesses are actually not just watching from their stands, but they are there to bear witness to us that God will see us through to the end. That they bear witness that He is faithful, and just as He sustained them, He will sustain us. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. (laughs) Brother, sister, whenever you feel discouraged, whenever you feel like you are losing faith or even losing hope it's a really good thing to go and read of the testimonies of those who ran this race and finished it's so good and so important to do that if you are struggling with feelings of revenge or desire to retaliate for what someone or a group of people have done to you, go and read about David's life and how he handled very similar situations as you are going through. If you feel like the job that God has given to you is way too big for you, go and study the life of Moses. If you have issues with insecurity and you do not feel qualified to the things that God has called you for, go and read about Gideon. If your life is filled with unfair and unjust outcomes, even though you're trying to do things right and yet you're trying to trust in God with all your heart but keeps going wrong and things keep going in an unfair manner, go read. Joseph's life. We need to get in the habit of turning to God's word when we feel discouraged, when we feel our our sense of hope is feeling less and less full and we're losing hope and we're feeling weary. Maybe you're a new believer or you do not know the scriptures well to say, okay, then this is where I go. 
that's okay. Go ahead and ask another believer and to recommend stories or passages for you to read. In fact, that kind of relationship we all need. That's what's called discipling, right? That we are to disciple one another. And so if you don't have that relationship, that is vital for every one of us from those who are teachers and teaching in the church to those who are coming right into the body of Jesus Christ because they put their faith in Him yesterday. Anywhere, we need to build these relationships where we can go to one another to point us to the Word of God, to praying together. It's so, so vital. That's the heart of discipleship to have and develop these kinds of relationships with other believers. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. So I I assume you're Kenny getting the word picture here because the the word picture is that of an athlete in, in doing whatever it takes to effectively run the race that is before them. And the first thing that the author of Hebrews here in chapter 12 tells us that we need to do if we are to run this race with this kind of endurance is to rid ourselves of every obstacle. Other translations um, use the word every weight or every hindrance. Basically anything that gets in the way that holds you back from moving forward and running this race of faith that God has set before you. And here's the thing, I can't run the race that God has set for you for you. And you can't run the race that God has set before me for me. We, We need to run this race that God has put and set before us. We can encourage each other. We can, we can love each other in this, but we need to each run it. And in, in order to do that, we're, we're seeing that we need to rid ourselves. We need to strip away anything that gets in the way, even good things, people of God, that may be good in the eyes of other people, but we know in our hearts they are weights for us. They're getting in the way for us to continue running whether it's a particular friendship or a group of people or a specific habit or hobby it's a pleasure or a type of entertainment even if it's neutral or good if it weighs you down christian we are instructed to strip it off to get rid of it and again i'm going back to how do we operate out of god's joy there's things that actually take, that keep us from operating out of that. Even, again, the, the neutral or good things in this world that are part of our life, we need to take careful consideration of these things. Additionally, in order to endure with joy, we must also rid ourselves of the sin which so easily entangles us. Speaking generally, this is the nature of sin. It ensnares us it entangles us to its power we have complete freedom from sin's power in christ that's one of the incredible wonderful miraculous works of the cross in our life it frees us 100 percent from the power of sin but there are things and habits and there's sins personally for us that if we are passive about, that we have no um, intention doing anything about, they will continue to entangle us. Do you know what I mean? There are, personally, for us individually, there are specific sins that if we are not intentional in doing anything about, they will constantly entangle us into the power of of sin. We have the absolute choice to live in complete freedom of it. But that's again a choice that we need to make to, to set our minds on the flesh or walk according to the Spirit. That's something we have the freedom to do. 
So if we don't do anything about them, it will continue and keep ensnaring us. And do you think, this is an honest question, do you think being entangled with sin impacts our ability to operate in God's joy? The answer is obvious. It's absolutely yes, it does. And again, if God's joy is not fueling our work and our service and our, our, what God has called us to do as His people, we won't have the endurance to keep going because our will is not enough. Our flesh is not enough. But the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah said, is our strength. Amen? It's our strength. So if you can relate to this, I I implore you to seek God about what practical first steps that you can take. Not not the whole mountain, but what what are the first steps that the Lord have you do to strip off the sin that so easily entangles you? Maybe you can even speak with God brothers and sisters that you trust even more than that i I say trust is important but even more than that believers who are demonstrating that they are living in loving obedience to the lord that's to me even more important because they know it's not just a by name christian but living in loving obedience to the lord Those believers, those brothers and sisters in Christ, when you ask them, they will lead you to life-giving truths. Sometimes it may be hard to hear. Sometimes it may be difficult to, to, to swallow. But the Bible tells us the wounds from a friend are so much better from, than the lies and deceits of, of an enemy. Get people's counsel and perhaps you're in an upper room or in a gathering and 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 or in a bible study you can share these things and and seek your the counsel of of other christians to to help you to to talk about these initial steps bring some accountability those those initial steps i tell you they are the hardest but they are life-giving and so vital for us to Run this race and endure it with his joy. Next, we must, and here's our second point, run with patient endurance. Um, This is an extra word that we're not seeing in the NASB translation where it says, let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. But the, 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 the picture that the writer of Hebrews is painting for us is this kind of patient endurance that the amplified version really um, amplifies that shows to us and i put it there for your notes as well and it says and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us so this is the manner in which we run how we run it's not about speed it's not about your ability, it's about an attitude, a mindset with patient endurance and active persistence. I ran across, as I was preparing for this message, a, a, a story that happened a long time ago of a man named Bill Broadhurst who, who entered a 10K, which is, you know, for some runners, not a big, big deal. This was back in 1981. He entered this race for a 10K. But 10 years before this, he had surgery. He underwent surgery for an aneurysm in his brain. So he had brain surgery. And, and, and it, what it ended up causing is complete paralysis on the left side of his entire body. And, and so he's standing here at the at the starting line, the sound of the gun goes off. And as you can probably imagine, all the other able body racers just surge way ahead of him, in some ways leaving him in the dust. And what Bill does is that he, he thrusts 
forward his, his left leg that's barely responsive so that he can use it to pivot and bring his other right leg in front. And then that's how he begins to run. And he continues in this fashion, not fast at all, painstakingly slow. In fact, he's experiencing pain in his ankle, sweat on through his whole head and body, but he continues steady with this patient endurance, unhindered, continuing. It takes 30 minutes for most of the race, other runners to finish this race. It takes him two hours and 29 minutes to finally cross the finish line. And by this point, most of all the other crowds who've been watching have left except for a small group. And out of this small group comes a man who walks towards him. And Bill Broadhurst recognizes the face of this man. It's Bill Rogers, a, a very famous marathon runner at that time and he he just won a medal for the marathon and he took that newly won medal and he draped it across Bill's neck and he said you worked harder for this than I have <sighs> even though Bill finished last it was truly a glorious finish. Why? Because of how he ran. He ran with an unhindered, un steady, patient endurance. And this is the manner to how we are called to run this race, to put one heavy foot in front of the other until we reach the end, that glorious end. It's not about speed. It's not about ability, but patient endurance, active persistence. And while we do, as we're running, we're instructed to focus on one thing and one thing only. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's our third point. Look only at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to run with patient endurance, and as we do, we look only to Jesus. Not to ourselves, not to others, not to the sin that entangles us, not to Satan's temptation or his threats or our fears, not the strategies or plans that we've laid out and are already in motion, not to even our own faith or weaknesses, or strengths, but to Christ alone. Let's learn from Peter. All the things I've written in Scripture, again, are to encourage us and teach us and show us. Remember as Peter, as he's stepping out of the boat, he walks on water because he's looking at Jesus. But the moment he starts to focus on the winds and the waves, and the, and the fear, he begins to sink. Let's learn from Peter to not look at the winds and the waves of our trials. To not set our minds upon the fears, but only at Jesus, the originator, the founder of our faith. This word originator uh, it's really so difficult to, to translate from the Greek into single word in the English. That's why if you look up different translations in the English language at least, you'll see the word um, also translated as founder of our faith, pioneer of our faith, leader of our faith. It's many different translations, but this, this basically means that Jesus was the one who paved the way 
a way that was impossible to perfect faith. He pioneered it. He lived a life as a human being in perfect faith in his Father. To understand with our mind the the fullness of who Jesus is as 100% God and 100% human is so profound and beyond our ability to conceptualize, but it is truth. However, the Bible is very clear that Jesus, although he was made in equality with God, he did not use his divinity to his own advantage. He did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped. And while living on earth, Jesus lived as a man like you and me in faith in God. And he trusted God fully with the whole of his being, with the whole of his life to live day after day day Jesus prayed as if his life depended on it in fact Jesus lived in utter dependence upon his father to lead him and to sustain him Jesus said that he would not utter a word unless he would he would only speak the words that his father commanded him to speak. His actions also were fully depended upon what he saw his father doing and he would just do in like manner. Jesus was a human who lived in perfect faith in God and he pioneered this way for us. Even in the darkness of death, breathing his very last breath, Jesus committed his spirit into the hands of his father. His whole life, he lived in perfect faith in God. You see, the people of faith that we talked about in Hebrews chapter 11, though they demonstrated incredible faith in God, they were simply examples of faith. But Jesus alone, he's the leader of our faith. He's the originator of our faith. He's the one who started the perfect faith. And he is living now to perfect his faith in us. As we look to him, as we fix our eyes upon him, as we don't look at anything else but only at Jesus. Jesus who lived in perfect faith has become the perfect object for our faith. And as we look to him alone, as we run, he's the one who perfects his faith in us. He's the originator, he's the founder, and he's the perfecter of our faith. And so Christian, going through the trial that you're going through, or that you might be going through here in the future. Remember, that's the testing of our faith, and that's a good thing, because God uses that to perfect our faith in Him. Just like He did so in His own Son, who lived in faith in Him. Same thing, remember that. So that's how we can consider it a great joy, That the testing of our faith as we go through these various trials produces this endurance. Produces a a perfect, more and more perfect faith. A faith that trusts in God completely. So we look only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of Father. Praise God. I I feel like I need to hear this so much. It's really for me personally just to hear this so much that it is for the joy set before Jesus, that Jesus interred the atrocities of the cross. 
the joy that was set before Jesus took absolute precedence over everything else that was going on in his life and in his situation on his journey to the cross and on the cross itself. This joy that was set before Jesus enabled him to endure the cross. And this being as we, as we celebrate um, what, we, we, the, the, what Jesus endured this week on the cross, we got to understand that it is this joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him to endure the abandonment from his, his disciples, the rejection, the mockery, the humiliation. It, it is the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure the, the horrible flogging that would, the, the, each and every one of those 40 lashes that would rip large pieces of flesh from his back that endured the striking of his head multiple times that drove the thorn of crowns deeper into his temples and into his forehead. It enabled him to endure the driving of these iron stakes through the, the joints of his wrist, through the flesh and bones of his feet. It enabled him to endure Endure the suffering of torture, of slow suffocation while he hung there on the cross. And that's just a physical aspect of it. The Bible tells us he, he who had no sin became sin for us. That all of humanity's sins, he bore it. He bore it. And do you know what that joy was that was set before him that endured for him to enable to endure the cross? That joy, joy was you. That joy was me. That we would be saved. We would be rescued. That we would be reconciled. That which was impossible by our own ways and our own efforts. That that, that would be accomplished. That we would be saved. That we would be free. This is what we celebrate here in this week as we lead to Easter Sunday. Jesus' choice to endure the cross his choice to lay down willingly his life for us. And he endured the cross because he saw past the cross to the joy of his resurrection, to the joy of his exaltation, the joy of taking his rightful place at the right hand of the throne of God and most of all the joy of sharing this joy with you and me. You see, the joy that was set before Jesus is not something that was just meant for Jesus alone. He, that in itself is incredible, but the joy he wants, the joy that was set before him is the joy that he wants to share with us, that he's given to us, to those that he has died for. Hmm. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Oh, if you don't, my friend, and you're listening to this message today, God wants you to hear it because He wants to save you because there is nothing that you can do about the sin in your life. And that sin separates you from God and it's your eternal destiny is in a forever death. A separation from God who is love, He is good, His, His light is everything that your heart desires. And there's an eternal separation. And, and He sent His one and only Son because He loves you. So that you won't perish. But instead you will have eternal life. Choose to believe in Jesus. Choose and reach out to Him to be your Savior. And He will save you. Oh, my friend, if you... If you have this desire and the Spirit of God is ministering in your heart to do so and you want 
to pray with somebody. We have that feature here. You can just press request in prayer and one of somebody on our connection team will pray with you. They will talk with you. They will provide spiritual counsel to you. We have no other agenda but just to share the love of God with you. And to have Jesus rescue you out of the domain of darkness. And into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is a forever salvation, my friend. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Oh, that is the message of the gospel. I believe he has for you to hear. And the joy that was set before him that endured the cross is the joy that he wants to share with you and I. And it is a great joy. In John 15, 11, Jesus spoke these words. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be made full. Oh, so that my joy, Jesus' joy may be in us. So that our joy may be full in Him. Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, reached this place of perfect faith first so that we can share that joy with Him, even through our most difficult trials here on earth. So as we run with patient endurance, we look only at Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And our last point today also to consider Jesus who endured. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The phrase, grow weary and lose heart, was actually sport language for that day in an age used to describe the, the collapse of a runner from pure exhaustion. That's the picture here. And so the way we are to avoid such a spiritual collapse is to consider Jesus who endured hostility by sinners against himself. Again, I want to emphasize Jesus did not live here on earth like some kind of superhero, immune to the common troubles of humanity. It's just the opposite, endured all of it. He was fully God, but he did not use his divinity to his own advantage, but instead he trusted in God fully as a man just like you and I can. Every resource of faith that's available to us that we can operate from was also what Jesus had. Every temptation that we face from the enemy, Jesus also faced and he never sinned. Every kind of suffering we experience, Jesus experienced, but he endured it. Not above it all, but with us all. So if some of you, many of you, I, I don't know. I just know that God has put this message on my heart to, to speak to, to those of you who are experiencing this, this kind of coming to the spiritual collapse or burnout. Consider Him who endured. What does that mean? How do we do that? Paul writes, and I feel like this is a, a really helpful way to bring to life this, this, this instruction to us here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, and read to 11. <clears throat> it reads this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So again, it's back to attitude. Take this attitude that Jesus had as well. Verse 6, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, God 
also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He humbled himself before the Lord into complete obedience, even to the point of death. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? When we're on a point of spiritual exhaustion and burnout, that at that point we are to consider Jesus who endured all the hostilities, to have the same attitude that he had, to humble ourselves, to empty ourselves before him, to take the, the, the form of a bondservant who willingly gives up their rights, the rights for love, the rights for from acceptance from others, the rights for dignity, the rights to be right, to rise, to be, to just be um, vindicated, all these, and to, to be willing to become obedient, even to the point of death. And that attitude, and that considering, and that identification with Jesus Christ is what brings the joy what brings that resurrection power, what brings the, the joy of the exaltation of Jesus in and through our life. You see, the joy that is available for us now. It's available for us now, but it's something that's actually set in the future. And if we're willing to embrace that in the here and now, See, past the cross of our situation, we'll be able to endure and also endure with joy. Let's move into our discussion and prayer points as we close today's service and message. The first question for your group and to talk about this within your, with your family, um, with the members of your gathering groups or in communion with God if you're alone in your in your own place there. Are you experiencing God's joy in your life now? I say take an honest assessment of that. Yep. And based on today's points in the message and on God's word, what do you think is the reason for how you've answered? Okay. What do you think is the reason for your answer? And then second, move into a time of prayer for one another based on what each of you share based on what God has revealed in your heart and then pray that Jesus' joy may be in us and that our joy may be made full. The very words that Jesus spoke and that he desired for each of his disciples. Praise God.